How's it going? This video is the start of the differences between the antipsychotics. And this video will be going into the differences between the pines. So that's quetiapine, olanzapine, and clozapine. All right, so let's start with quetiapine, which is Seroquel. So let's walk through the FDA approvals. It's approved in schizophrenia for teens, adults, and as maintenance therapy, with the recommended dose of 400 to 800 milligrams per day. When it comes to the FDA for bipolar, there's multiple aspects of bipolar that can get FDA approval. And there's typically three big categories you should know about. And those are one, acute episodes, two, maintenance therapy, and three, depressive episodes. So for Seroquel, it's approved for bipolar 1, manic or mixed episodes, either as monotherapy or as an adjunct to lithium or Depakote. It's approved in depressive episodes for adults, and it's also approved in bipolar 1 maintenance, but as an adjunct to lithium or Depakote. I should also note that the depressive episode, the recommended dose is 300 milligrams per day for bipolar disorder. And then lastly, Seroquel is also approved for major depressive disorder as an adjunctive therapy with antidepressants. And here the recommended dose is 150 to 300 milligrams. So basically, Seroquel has FDA approval for the big three psychiatric diagnoses. Kind of makes me think it's a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. Now moving on to black box warnings. It carries the warning that all the second-gen antipsychotics have, which is increased mortality in elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis. And then it also carries increased suicidal thoughts and behaviors in children, adolescents, and young adults taking antidepressants. Here's a receptor list taken from stalls. The things worth mentioning here are the massive antihistamine blockade in the beginning, the fact that norquetiapine, which is a metabolite of quetiapine, also is responsible for a lot of the receptor profile. Moving on to the pharmacokinetics, we know that Seroquel is metabolized by CYP3A4, so of course that means you should be careful when you're using it with 3A4 inducers and inhibitors. The half-life for IR is 6 hours and XR is 7 hours, but let's move on to the discussion about the more interesting things about Seroquel. So the first thing we should talk about is that Seroquel has different indications at different dosages. And the way that Stahl pitches this in a cute way is he says that there's the baby bear, the mama bear, and the papa bear. The baby bear is Seroquel at 50 milligrams. And basically what he puts forth is baby bear is a good sedative hypnotic, mama bear is good for the mood disorders, and then papa bear is good for the antipsychotic. I personally would argue that they're probably bad for all three of those things, but let's continue. So for the baby bear, which is 50 milligrams, it's basically just blocking all histamine. So it's just an incredibly sedating medication, and it's insufficient for treating depression. So this dose is commonly used as a sleeping aid, which I think is a bad thing. The side effects far outweigh the benefits, and there's little evidence of benefit, and there's a lot of concern for adverse effects. It's almost as if you're using an expensive, higher-risk antihistamine. Now, the mama bear dose, which is 300 milligrams, is where it's used as an antidepressant. So this is approved for bipolar depression and for augmenting SSRIs and SNRIs in unipolar depression. So at this dose, there's blockade of 5-HT2A, 5-HT2C, 5-HT1A, as well as inhibition of the net transporter and D2. And lastly, we have the papa bear dose of 800 milligrams, which is used as an antipsychotic with a relatively wide binding profile. An important takeaway for the mama bear and papa bear doses is that the quetiapine XR is the more effective medication because you're hitting the receptors that you're targeting at a longer duration. So you have less peak sedation and a duration of action for the entire day. So first, let's talk about quetiapine use in schizophrenia. When it comes to efficacy of these medications, a lot of times you'll see logically absurd results, which makes it hard to parse out what the truth is, because you'll see quetiapine is better than zeprazidone, zeprazidone is better than aripiprazole, aripiprazole is better than quetiapine, manifesting the logical paradox that is psychiatry. But the general pattern that I see is that it goes clozapine's the best, olanzapine's the second best, then risperdal, and then all the other ones are kind of behind it. But then the rebuttal for as to why you would use these medications is that the magnitude of difference isn't that great and you're weighing it against the side effect profile. So here's a quick test question. What's the most effective antipsychotic? It's the one the patient will actually take. Now, when it comes to EPS, quetiapine and clozapine are known for their relative lack of extrapyramidal side effects. Clozapine and quetiapine might be the only ones that are fully atypical, and by that I mean low propensity for EPS. So the pines are just a good option for patients who experience EPS on another medication. This helps me remember that quetiapine might be the preferred antipsychotic for psychosis in Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. So it's probably the most widely used for treatment of Parkinson's psychosis, along with clozapine. And a lot of people use Seroquel first because of clozapine side effects, but clozapine might be better. Now, when it comes to side effects, it's important to note that it has a lot of histamine blockade, so there's a lot of sedation and weight gain. The weight gain is probably less than clozapine and olanzapine, and probably more than all the other antipsychotics. 
And the fun fact for Seroquel, because you, you gotta have fun facts, is that in contrast to other antipsychotics, Seroquel is sometimes used recreationally. And it's probably mostly in the prison population where access to the good stuff is limited, but it's referred to as quell or baby heroin. And I read somewhere that it's called a cue ball, which is IV quetiapine mixed with cocaine. <laughs> so maybe the thinking there is that the sedative effects of quetiapine may mitigate the dysphoria with the cocaine withdrawal. So my one-liner for quetiapine is it's approved for schizophrenia, basically all aspects of bipolar, and as an adjunct for depression. It's useful in Parkinson's psychosis because of its very low risk for EPS. However, sedation, weight gain, and orthostasis may limit its use, and even though it's commonly used for insomnia, it, it really shouldn't be. All right, next we have olanzapine, which is also known as Zyprexa. It's approved for schizophrenia in teens and adults. It's gotten approval for maintaining response in schizophrenia with the long-acting injectable. It also has the triple whammy for bipolar. So it's approved for acute and mixed manic episodes. It's approved for bipolar maintenance. And then when it's combined with fluoxetine, which is called Symbiax, uh, it's approved for bipolar depression. And then Symbiax also has approval for treatment-resistant unipolar depression. And then it's also approved for acute agitation in schizophrenia and bipolar mania when it's used in an injection form. So it's worth talking about the different forms that Zyprexa comes in. So of course it just is an oral medication. It also comes in what's called an ODT, which is an orally disintegrating tablet. So ODT can be used for patients who have difficulty swallowing, but really it's used for when compliance is a possible issue. So on the inpatient unit, sometimes you'll see it be used for patients who are worried about cheeking medications. It comes in a short-acting intramuscular form for acute agitation. It comes in the form of a long-acting injectable. And it's worth noting that a post-injection syndrome has been reported, which is called post-injection delirium sedation syndrome, or PDSS. And it occurs when the medication is accidentally given intravascularly. So you kind of just get this mega dose of Zyprexa. And it's because of this that it's required that patients are observed for three hours post-injection by a healthcare provider. And then Zyprexa also comes in the form of Symbiax when it's combined with fluoxetine. And most recently, when Zyprexa is combined with Samidorphin, it's called Libalvi. And the quote from the press release is, With the efficacy of olanzapine and evidence of less weight gain in patients with schizophrenia, Libalvi brings a welcome new addition to our medication arsenal. And who knows, it might be great. I'm just skeptical of new expensive stuff. And here are the receptors that olanzapine hits. In terms of pharmacokinetics, it's metabolized by 1A2, slightly by 2D6, and by direct chronidation. The half-life is 1 to 2 days, and food isn't known to affect the absorption. It's super duper important to know that smoking significantly decreases the amount of clozapine and olanzapine in the blood. And this isn't just some theoretical difference. Smoking just 10 cigarettes a day is sufficient to cause the maximum induction of clozapine and olanzapine metabolism. And the reason why this interaction occurs is because the chemicals in tobacco smoke, specifically the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, induce CYP1A2. So there's a few things worth knowing in regards to this interaction. So it's the tobacco smoke that has the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So that means that nicotine replacement therapy is not going to affect the levels. And the reduction in levels is significant, likely up to 50%, but the numbers I see is typically like 35% reduction. All right, let's move into the pearls that we need to know about Cyprexa. So the really important one is that it causes significant weight gain. And the amount of weight can be substantial. 10 to 30 pounds is very common. And these metabolic side effects are associated with all the second gen antipsychotics, but they're particularly the worst for olanzapine and clozapine. And it's important to note that the metabolic side effects aren't just the result of the weight gain. The medications appear to directly induce insulin resistance. So that means that you can have impaired glucose tolerance even in the absence of obesity or a family history of diabetes, which means it's important to monitor these things even if you don't see the patient gaining weight. But moving on, I think here's a good place to discuss the results of the Katie trial. And in this trial, they compared olanzapine, perfenazine, quetiapine, risperidone, and zeprazidone. And there are some pretty important takeaways from this study. So overall, 74% of people discontinue the medications before 18 months. I think this is a really important thing to keep in mind. These medications are not fun to be on. But what this trial found was that olanzapine was the most effective in terms of rates of discontinuation. So time to discontinuation for any cause was longer in the olanzapine group than in the quetiapine or risperidone group. And as I said earlier, in meta-analyses that compare the efficacy of symptoms, typically the order is clozapine, then olanzapine, and then the other ones behind it. Which makes sense because the chemical structure of olanzapine is similar to clozapine. But the biological reason as to why these medications are more efficacious is really unknown. One interesting thing about olanzapine is it reduces nausea and vomiting, especially in cancer patients. And it showed a significant difference in these symptoms in patients taking chemotherapy. The next important thing to talk about is that olanzapine is effective in acute agitation in the intramuscular form. Some studies have shown that IM Zyprexa is more effective than IM Haldol. But a lot of studies have shown that they're about equal, but 
remember that Zyprexa is associated with lower incidence of EPS. But it's important to note that intramuscular Zyprexa should not be combined with an intramuscular benzodiazepine. The reason for this is Eli Lilly placed a warning on Zyprexa following post-marketing reports of fatal interactions when the two are combined. It's not entirely clear if the data shows that this is warranted, but it's still probably best to avoid the combination given that there are alternatives. You can see in the FDA approvals for the mood disorders that Zyprexa is effective in depression and bipolar. But I'll just repeat that it has efficacy as an augmenting agent for SSRIs, especially with Prozac in non-psychotic treatment-resistant depression. And it's got efficacy in bipolar depression with Prozac. And in regards to mania, among the newer antipsychotics, the drugs olanzapine, risperidone, quetiapine, aripiprazole, and acenapine are the ones that have been the most well studied. And the last important thing to know I already said, but smoking significantly impacts Zyprexa levels. So whenever a patient changes their smoking habits, it's important to probably adjust the dose of Zyprexa. And again, it's the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in tobacco smoke that causes the interaction, not the nicotine. So the one-liner is that olanzapine is probably one of the most effective antipsychotics just below clozapine, however with significant weight gain and metabolic complications. It's effective for mood disorders and for acute agitation, and it's important to be aware of the interaction with smoking, especially given the high prevalence of smoking in schizophrenic patients. All right, that brings us to our next drug, which is clozapine, or clozaril. <laughs> So clozapine is FDA approved for treatment resistant schizophrenia and reduction in risk of suicide in schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder. It carries five black box warnings. So the first is the risk of agranulocytosis and neutropenia. The second is it decreases the seizure threshold. The third is the increased risk of myocarditis. The fourth is other adverse cardiovascular or respiratory effects, and it discusses especially the orthostatic hypotension and has a caution when used with benzos given the risk of respiratory arrest. And lastly, the classic increased mortality risk in elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis. Here are the receptors clozapine hits, and the reason for the superior efficacy of clozapine is not really known. In regards to the pharmacokinetics, it's metabolized by 1A2 and to a lesser extent 2D6 and 3A4. The discussion I had about cigarette smoke applies to clozapine as well, and the half-life is 12 hours. So before jumping into the discussion about side effects, let's talk about why clozapine is awesome. So clozapine is the gold standard for treatment refractory schizophrenia. So for patients who are determined to be treatment refractory, 50 to 60% of people respond to clozapine, and that's compared to 0 to 9% for other atypicals. Clozapine also seems to be effective in other treatment refractory conditions like bipolar. It also reduces the risk of suicide in schizophrenia, and it's the only antipsychotic that does that. Clozapine also has a particular niche in treating aggression and violence in psychosis. So to recap, it's got advantages in treatment-resistant schizophrenia, violence, and suicidal behavior. And those are all really big deals. So currently, clozapine is only recommended for patients who have failed two adequate antipsychotic trials. And the reason why that's the conventional wisdom is because of the side effects and monitoring burden of clozapine. However, some studies have shown that clozapine is associated with the lowest risk of mortality among all antipsychotics. So it's not entirely clear if we should really be restricting the medication to the degree that we do. But there really are major side effects, so let me review them. So the really common ones are sedation, hypersalivation, constipation, orthostatic hypotension, and then also hypertension, tachycardia, weight gain, a benign fever, seizures, and nausea and tachycardia. And clozapine actually probably has the greatest degree of weight gain amongst all antipsychotics. But it's worth noting that doesn't mean that every single patient gains a lot of weight, but it's impossible to predict which ones will. And now I'm just going to talk about the more serious but less common side effects. So the one that a lot of people worry about is the increased risk of blood dyscrasias, particularly agranulocytosis and neutropenia. And this typically occurs in the first 18 weeks of treatment. And the vast majority occur within the first year. So after a year, the risk falls back to the same risk as the other antipsychotics. So as a way of combating this, there exists what's called clozapine REMS which is a safety program required by the FDA to manage the risk of severe neutropenia. Basically, providers have to follow the monitoring guidelines and show the absolute neutrophil count before the medication can be dispensed by the pharmacy. The next serious side effect is the myocarditis and cardiomyopathy. So the myocarditis occurs typically within the first eight weeks of treatment, and it's a hypersensitivity response to the medication that leads to inflammation in the myocardium. So symptoms that you should take very seriously, especially within the first eight weeks of treatment, are when patients have hypotension, tachycardia, fever, flu-like symptoms, fatigue, dyspnea, or chest pain. Now, of course, clozapine on its own causes orthostatic hypotension, and it also causes a benign fever, 
but you don't want to miss myocarditis. And as for the cardiomyopathy, a dilated cardiomyopathy is a late complication, so a lot of people recommend annual EKGs when you're taking clozapine. The next serious side effect is gastrointestinal hypomobility. Basically, you get really, really bad constipation. So the constipation can be so bad that a patient gets fecal impaction, and it can lead to a paralytic ileus and a bowel obstruction, and can even lead to an acute megacolon. An interesting little tidbit is that clozapine-induced GI hypomotility has a higher mortality rate than the agranulocytosis. So it's really not something you should mess around with. It's important to monitor patients' bowel functions and even preemptively use laxatives. Patients should know that they should tell their provider if they have less than three bowel movements per week or if they're unable to pass gas. The next side effect I'm going to mention is the hypersalivation, which might not sound like a big deal, but it's socially embarrassing and can negatively impact people's lives. It might also play a role in the patient's increased risk for pneumonia. So hypersalivation is a pretty unexpected side effect given the receptor profile. Given its serious muscarinic antagonism, you would expect dry mouth. So the proposed mechanisms is that maybe it's the M4 blockade, which has the opposite effect of M3 blockade. And I've also seen that the alpha-2 blockade might inhibit the swallowing reflex. So it might be that clozapine interrupts the coordination between cortical and cranial nerve structures involved in swallowing, and that leads to saliva pooling. But it should be known this side effect can be treated. It probably makes the most sense to use atropine or ipratromium bromide sublingually because you don't want to increase the systemic anti-muscarinic activity that's already prevalent in clozapine. It's also worth noting the increased risk of thromboembolism and the fact that patients on clozapine have a 20 times higher risk of a pulmonary embolism. Also, it should be known that the medication is very sedating. But let me get back to the good stuff. So clozapine has been demonstrated to produce improved outcomes in a lot of domains, including a reduced risk of hospitalization, a reduced risk of drug discontinuation, and a reduction in overall symptoms. And it should be known that despite the wide range of side effects, patients typically report good levels of satisfaction compared to the other's antipsychotics. And despite all the risk monitoring that goes along with clozapine, it's known to be highly cost-effective. I think it's pretty fair to say that clozapine's wildly underutilized. But before you go prescribing it, you need to pay attention to the fact that only certain patients are appropriate for clozapine. So you have to ask yourself, will this patient be adherent? Will they be able to understand the monitoring and the blood tests? Will they understand the adverse effects and what to do if they experience them? Can they follow the strict monitoring guidelines that are required for the medication? And will they seek out help if they experience these adverse side effects? So the one-liner for clozapine is that it's considered the gold standard treatment when other medications don't work in schizophrenia. It's typically only used after two failed trials of antipsychotics, and that's because of the major side effects, the most well-known one being neutropenia, but also the GI hypomobility and the myocarditis. But despite all these things, it's probably still a very focused.